So the Security Assurance Framework uh, is an, an initiative that uh, we've put together in the uh, in the Security Infrastructure and Trust Working Group. And what this uh, framework does is it provides a comprehensive overview of threats and vulnerabilities to the digital financial services ecosystem from the perspective of a number of uh, different stakeholders throughout the DFS ecosystem from the standpoint, for example, of users, uh, mobile network operators, um, third party providers, etc. So what is important about this framework and what makes it uh, particularly useful is that by providing this comprehensive overview of threats and vulnerabilities from the perspective of uh, the different uh, stakeholders, we have a very uh, expansive overview of uh, the potential uh, threats and vulnerabilities to the system. So the digital, um, the security assurance framework itself uh, categorizes the threats uh, to the DFS ecosystem. Uh, and as part of this, uh, th this framework, we have developed uh, controls that are designed to mitigate uh, the threats uh, that we've, uh, uh, that we've uh, discussed. Uh, and the threats uh, themselves come from a wide variety of sources, uh, external documentation, other ITU documents, et cetera, so that we have a, a complete overview of these uh, of these threats. And we've developed over 100 controls that we've identified um, through this examination of the threats and uh, potential vulnerabilities to the different stakeholders. Uh, so this is a very comprehensive look at uh, how uh, threats can occur within the uh, ecosystem and how to address those threats through security controls. Now, the audit guidelines are developed with, uh, uh, particularly with uh, our regulators and providers in mind. And what we do with those um, audit guidelines is that we take the security controls, which themselves are actionable ways of, by which one can address uh, the threats that have been um, uh, disclosed or, or threats that are potentially found within uh, the ecosystem. And uh, the controls themselves provide ways of mitigating those threats and the auditing guidelines themselves provide a way of uh, examining whether those controls have been applied. So we've actually developed uh, the audit guidelines as a, as a checklist that an auditor can use uh, through a series of yes, no questions to uh, determine whether uh, the uh, controls have been uh, put in place for the, to address the particular threats that we've identified. Additionally, the uh, threats, the, the auditing uh, guidelines themselves uh, link to policy documents that auditors can use to look uh, so that they have some ideas where to look within um, an, uh, in a corporate environment or a provider's environment in order to ensure that uh, they've got the documentation uh, to uh, correlate um, the auditing uh, guidelines with uh, internal controls. The security assurance framework and the corresponding audit guidelines in particular are important for DFS regulators and providers. Our regulators can use the framework uh, to assess uh, the security of the ecosystem in which uh, their digital financial services are being deployed. And the auditing framework provides a means of assessing uh, for providers um, and operators uh, whether uh, the controls are being adhered to uh, and uh, <clears throat> whether uh, best practices are being put into place. Now, from the standpoint of uh, providers, this is also a very valuable document because providers can use uh, these controls to assure uh, that they are uh, that they've uh, demonstrated security in their own environment. Uh, moreover, uh, these uh, guidelines and the auditing framework can provide them with the tools to help them uh, find uh, potential weaknesses in their system. Uh, and that's uh, an important thing because vulnerabilities can be very costly uh, to a provider if they are exploited. So by having the ability to assess these, uh, uh, these guidelines uh, and uh, using the auditing framework uh, to assess their, uh, their own security, they can themselves uh, provide uh, stronger assessment of their own capabilities and potentially find uh, weaknesses that could end up costing them uh, real money. So USSD and STK are two valuable means by which uh, DFS services can be deployed, but they provide uh, different uh, vulnerability landscapes. With USSD, a USSD runs uh, where the application runs on the provider side 
uh, and the uh, uh, the client with their mobile phone uh, connects uh, to the application over the air. The air interface itself uh, is potentially a, a, a weakness uh, if um, depending on the level of encryption that's used in the over the air uh, communications between the mobile device and the base station. Uh, if that um, if that interface is being protected by uh, a weak uh, encryption cipher, then uh, an adversary can potentially eavesdrop on that information or potentially inject their own uh, their own uh, malicious information. Uh, moreover, uh, with USSD, uh, there is no end-to-end -end security. The from the mobile device uh, to the uh, USSD gateway, uh, there is not a single uninterrupted end-to-end um, -end encrypted um, uh, communication. When communication gets to the base station, uh, it is then um, uh, decrypted and it is sent uh, through the uh, through the mobile network and unless uh, uh, mechanisms are used to ensure the security of that information then it can be potentially exposed uh, so this is uh, potentially uh, valuable uh, personal information uh, about uh, uh, consumers uh, and their payment information uh, moreover uh, remote attacks are possible in the uh, ussd environment uh, particularly through uh, for example the ss7 um, control channel um, and uh, additionally um, uh, devices such as smartphones can be compromised uh, if they are already rooted and uh, that can be a means by which um, uh, ussd uh, communication can be compromised as well now stk uh, has a different profile in that um, STK has the benefit of being end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, however, there are other um, uh, issues that need to be addressed with, uh, with SDK applications. Uh, apps can't be updated without bringing a phone to a provider. So that means that uh, it's uh, very difficult to provide things like security updates. Moreover, there are physical attacks that are possible against the SIM card that are used in SDK or SIM toolkit applications. Um, physical attacks can be um, uh, performed if, uh, for example, overlay SIMs are placed on top of the uh, SIM, uh, leading to so-called man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, additionally, uh, SIM swaps are a, a major issue that need to be uh, uh, considered. A SIM swap is the means by which uh, a SIM card is um, maliciously uh, changed out. Uh, for example, I call a provider, I say that I've lost my SIM, uh, but I'm actually an adversary, and uh, this would cause the deactivation of the victim's real SIM card, allowing me to use my SIM card in their place. So if that happens, then I have a means by which I could potentially attack a system. Uh, there's also issues such as uh, the recycling of numbers. So I, if those numbers contain a DFS information, and that's linked to a, a particular SIM card identity, then um, uh, if that number is recycled, then I could potentially, as an adversary, get access to that information. So the threats are different uh, in some ways, and each has their own uh, benefits uh, and drawbacks, and uh, one needs to be careful uh, about the deployment environment, depending on which technology they're, they're planning to deploy within their particular ecosystem. So the best thing that can be done in these environments to ensure the security of consumers using uh, these technologies, whether they're their USSD or uh, SIM toolkit, are first and foremost uh, using a strong radio in, uh, encryption algorithms uh, over the air interface. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, between um, uh, the mobile device and the base station, if that uh, air interface uh, uh, encryption algorithm is weak, then it can be potentially compromised. So, using ensuring that you that uh, one is using strong encryption algorithms there is going to be important to ensuring um, uh, the security of that uh, of that interface. Uh, the, um, the use of uh, uh, standardized uh, strong encryption algorithms within provider networks, in particular uh, the transport layer security, TLS, at least version 1.2 uh, or 1.3, if that's been deployed in your environment, uh, that's an important uh, way of uh, by which uh, the network itself can be hardened. Uh, it's also important to that uh, strong internal controls are in place. For example, especially in USSD environments where data can be uh, uh, unencrypted at the base station, making sure that uh, anywhere where uh, there's a transfer of information or where it's potentially revealed in plain text, that that, that, um, that data is, uh, there's a limit of access as to who can get to that information to ensure that uh, malicious insiders uh, can't uh, get access to that information. Uh, strong internal controls are important for both SDK and USSD environments. Uh, finally, uh, it's important to monitor uh, uh, sessions 
of uh, users to be able to detect uh, anonymous activity. For example, long timeouts uh, followed by uh, new interactions coming from a different location could be evidence of a SIM swap uh, occurring. So uh, strong internal controls, uh, st uh, use of standardized strong algorithms and uh, strong mechanisms to ensure uh, monitoring of the network are all means by which uh, the threats uh, to the DFS ecosystem through USSD and STK can be mitigated.